<coughs> yes, so welcome, Ramon. Uh, the topic of today is uh, an analysis of Latin American left. We had, uh, after the Cuban revolution, an upsurge in all kinds of Latin American guerrilla movement, popular movement. We had a victory in Chile in 1973, and then the disaster uh, of, of the coup, uh, Allende, which we had the military dictatorships across uh, Latin America, and then uh, you see the Nicaraguan revolution uh, brought some uh, impetus for left-wing movement. Eventually, we got obviously Venezuela, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, uh, uh, all, all, all these places where a kind of new left was beginning to, to take shape. And then you see the setback where uh, Lula is in prison, the coup against the Workers' Party takes place in Brazil, um, leftist movement losing elections, uh, and now it seems that the pendulum is moving a bit uh, to the left with the victory in uh, uh, Bolivia. Obviously, uh, we're looking forward to what's going on in Ecuador. Uh, so let, let's try to figure out what kind of left are we talking about when we talk about the left in Latin America and the Caribbean? Uh, obviously, the Cuban Revolution stands as a huge victory uh, where they couldn't destroy the revolution uh, despite everything they tried from the blockade, invasion. Um, uh, and, and Cuba holds its ground. And then the, the second important and strong thing was obviously Hugo Chavez and Venezuela. Uh, uh, but he came to power with elections. So it was a totally different situation where you got state power and the kind of state power you have inherited, you have to deal with, which is different from what Cuba had. And obviously uh, all the other countries are countries where the election is a mechanism to gain state power. Uh, the, it's not an uprising of an armed revolution. It is basically a mechanism of, of the electorate that decides whether you get state power and then how that state power is used to transform society. So let me get your take of your analysis of how you look at the Latin American left. Yeah, I, let me question the question. Let me begin there because the problem with the, these terms, we need to define these terms clearly so we know what we're talking about. That is when we say right or left today, it's like if you don't contextualize what that means in different contexts, uh, you might get confused, okay? So, um, I always talk about left and right in relation to uh, context, political context. But the political context is defined by who is the main enemy and who are your allies against the enemy, okay? And <clears throat> to simplify a lot, in Latin America, the main enemy is US imperialism, okay? That's the main enemy. And all the allies and institutions and structures of, of domination that are tied to that structure of power. And in the case of Latin America, you need to add the uh, oligarchies, especially most of them whites, races, white supremacies, the son of the colonizers from Spain and Portugal in most of Latin America, um, who are the ones running the countries and the neo-colonial states. These are formal independent states who are still under the control and domination of US empire, US imperialism. So, uh, so when we say the enemy 
you know, who is the enemy of the people, who is the people, you know, this is related to a context of, you know, a relations of forces, you know, and who is the main enemy and who are the allies against the enemy, you know, and, and this is what defines for me at least what is right, what is left, okay? For me, the left is the block of the oppressed people against the dominant power. And for me, all the allies of that dominant power are part of the right wing, okay? And so, um, so um, within then the term left, you need to then um, be subtle about the, the heterogeneity and the diversity of left projects. Uh, or let's use another term, which is more a weak term than left, which is progressive governments, no? And when you talk about progressive or reactionary, we're always talking in relation to the same question. Who is the enemy? Who is the enemy of the people? Who are the people oppressing, uh, you know, the, the popular masses of, you know, who is the, and against that, who are the people who are, in a sense, fighting them, even if they don't fight them in the whole, against the whole system, they might be fighting them in aspects of that system and that's what made them progress, okay? And so in Latin America, we need to distinguish among the so-called progressive governments. Because there were some of these governments who were fully anti-imperialist, okay? Like for example, the Bolivian government and the Venezuelan government. And there were other governments that were not anti-imperialist, but have contradiction with imperialism, okay? Uh, and those contradictions was what made them to be a little, you know, progressive. For example, uh, we need to distinguish the Bolivarian Revolution, which was anti-clare itself as being overtly anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, uh, anti-patriarchal, I mean, they, they call for a full transformation of the system. Uh, then you have the Bolivian revolution that has been more anti-imperialist, uh, less anti-capitalist, okay, uh, in its expressions, um, at least during the Evo Morales years. Uh, even though here and there, there might be some overt critics to the capitalist system, but they were in a sense less radical than the expression you see under Hugo Chavez, Nicolás Maduro and the Bolivarian revolution. Then I'm talking now about degrees of radicalness, okay? Then you have the Correa government, okay? Over many years in Ecuador that was progressive, but you know, was not exactly an anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist project. It was more a developmentalist project, anti-neoliberal. You see, they wanted the development of Ecuador. A, 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 this guy, a Correa, is an economist. He was, so he was thinking as an economist how to develop Ecuador. In doing that, he entered in contradiction with US empire and the US pro-empire media and so on because he was challenging the neoliberal um, sacred, uh, you know, you know, recommendations, you know, and he was trying to then uh, do policies that were uh, counter current to, to the neoliberal project of white capitalism that the U.S. has been promoted. So he was not exactly, you cannot say this is the left, he was more progressive, but with a lot of contradictions that we're going to discuss more in a, in a few minutes as we uh, discuss in more detail the Ecuadorian case. Uh, and then you have Lula. And Lula was a kind of mixture, uh, that was a very strange mixture of some neoliberal policies that kept going at the same time that he was doing some kind of social redistribution of wealth, okay? Through the state, okay? Doing programs against pro-poverty, 
programs for affirmative action for black population in, in Brazil, uh, programs for um, di different progressive issues, you know, against racism, against, uh, you know, super exploitation workers. That is, uh, so, but it was within the, in a sense, still very much within the system and even be producing some neoliberal policies, okay? Uh, so it was a mixture that the government of Lula, but it was in a sense progressive because it was, it took out of poverty millions of people through that redistribution of wealth, you know? And um, they, Brazil have their own, you know, controversial resources that never privatized during Lula, I mean, the, the oil or the, the you know natural resources that multinationals are eager to control. So with that money, he was able to do a lot of things for the people that were very progressive. Okay. Then you have the government in Argentina of the Kirchner's, who was also progressive, you know, because like Korea was more like Korea that was the entering contradiction with the neoliberal policies that have led Argentina to bankruptcy. And they were now developing a complete different policy away from the IMF, like Correa, uh, away from, you know, uh, the neoliberal um, sacred recipes, you know, and so on. And they were, in a sense, they brought some kind of improvement to the economic situation of popular masses in, in Argentina, you know. Um, but all these governments are very different and very, for example, Correa in many ways, even though he was progressive in relation to neoliberalism and all of that, he was kind of in relation to the indigenous movement, he has his own contradictions, you know, because he reproduced a lot of colonialism and even racist. Uh, you know, uh, characterizations and stuff, you know? Um, and uh, Kirchner government was kind of a progressive too, but how can I say was, these were not radical left or left. I, I wouldn't call them left as such, I would call them more progressive, okay? Uh, in the context of the relation of forces of Argentina, and Ecuador, they represent the closest you can get to a left, okay? The closest, even though, but within that context, uh, when you have options who to vote in an election, you know, you vote for them because that was the best thing among the candidates, you see? Uh, but they were not fully left, okay? And the same thing happened with Lula in Brazil. Uh, but then came the counteroffensive of imperialism. That is, the U.S. did not like this move in Latin America. Even, you know, progressive governments, U.S. did not tolerate. You see, even government that you cannot call them, you know, left or radical or anything like that, the U.S. didn't like that because the U.S. is an imperialist power that wants to super exploit the region, both in terms of exploitation labor and resources. So they didn't like that a lot of these government were nationalizing resources or did not want to privatize them or were keeping the wealth of these resources in the hands of the state to redistribute among poor people and so on. I mean, uh, improving education, healthcare, improving all kinds of things. US didn't like this. You know, so it shows you also the limits of the imperialist system that even governments that you cannot say that they are radical or anything like that, they don't tolerate them because they want everything. It's not about, oh, let's let them get this and then we get this other piece of the pie. No, no, they want the whole pie, okay? They don't wanna share any piece of the pie, okay? Especially that US is a decadent empire. So U.S. have lost the wars in the Middle East. U.S. have lost the market, uh, markets in Africa, Asia, and uh, against China. 
China in Latin America is still very strong to the point that became the number one import export power in many countries. So US came with a counter offensive in Latin America to try to uh, recolonize the region because they were losing control. And they, at least that's how they felt. And, and they went after all these governments. So they went, for example, the Celaya government in Honduras, which was sort of like similar or close to something like Correa. Mm -hmm. uh, and the government in uh, um, Lugo in Paraguay, that maybe was something like Lula or something like that. Um, and and they, they began to do what is called a soft coup d'etat. In the Pentagon papers, it's called the fourth, gener uh, fourth generation wars. Uh, but that means that they learned that the old forms of doing coup d'etat with a military regime and stuff like that is too costly economically and politically. So they decided that there are other ways to do coup d'etat and, and the models they, they're using in many places is the model of the, the mobilizations, if you remember in the eighties against the Eastern European, uh, you know, the Soviet bloc, you know, mm -hmm. they were, it's called the, it's called the color revolutions, mm -hmm. you know, or the rainbow revolution, I think mm -hmm. is the name in English. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was translating from Spanish. I think it's the rainbow revolutions, uh, multicolor revolutions that is financed by the CIA. And what they do is they mobilize discontent people among the population. They give them resources, they give them media uh, access to put their platform out there. And then they start mobilizing people against the government that the CIA and the empire wants to top up, okay? And then they do some kind of, uh, they, they either destroy the government or they do a soft coup d'etat through parliamentary means. And there are all these methods of doing this. And one of them is creating hyperinflation. And they did that with Allende in Chile. They did that with Nicaragua, Nacionalista Revolution in the eighties. That is by devaluating the currency of the country you create hyperinflation by creating hyperinflation. A lot of the people cannot purchase basic needs like medicine and food. And then if you don't, if you're not aware where the sabotage is coming from, you think that is the back government in place that is creating this hyperinflation. And then people, they're discontent, they channel it against the government the empire wants to topple. They're doing that in Venezuela right now without success because the conscious, con the anti imperialist consciousness of Venezuelan people is quite high. So they know where the problem is coming and why are they coming for, okay? And, and so they're resisting all this aggression from US empire, but in other places, it's more difficult to do that if you don't have a population with a high anti imperialist consciousness. They did that in Egypt and put Al-Sisi as dictator there and still the dictator in Egypt today, destroying the, the Arab Spring movement there to democratize Egypt. Uh, they, they did that with Evo Morales a year ago, you know, and, and but they failed because after a year, they, the, 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 the mass movement, you know, the, the party of called MAS, M-A-S, uh, came back to power in the elections last November. Um, and anyway, so the whole attempt of this sub or even strong coup d'etat is done precisely to recover the natural resources of the countries and markets and super exploitation labor. So they want to, re to, to control Latin America is the last periphery of US empire in the world today. If they lost Latin America to China or other empire, they, they're lost. The, the US empire goes down, you know? So basically that's the last remaining 
uh, periphery of U.S. empire, and they're doing everything they can to stop any kind of progressive or leftist governments to be successful. So they're doing coup d'etat, what is called this sub coup d'etat. In some cases, they're not even sub like the Evo Morales coup in November 2019 against Evo Morales, the indigenous president of Bolivia. And uh, it was really, uh, there were many massacres there against indigenous people during the coup and after the coup by the dictatorship, dictators who came to power. Uh, finally, the, the pressure was such that they have to put election and then the, the, again, the, the movement won the election, they're back in power now. Uh, so they defeated the dictatorship, you know. Uh, so this shows that there are, there is a struggle in Latin America today about the future of the region because U.S. empire is doing anything they can to cut off Latin America from China, from Russia, from competing empires, right? But also cut off from any progressive government that will put in question their control of resources, markets, and profits, okay? So, um, so this is the, 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 let's put it this way, the dilemma that Latin America is living today as a region is more U.S. empire uh, trying to, to, to keep control in the region in the way they, they've been doing for now uh, more than a hundred years, you know? And, and so this is the, the struggle going on today. Yeah, let's, let's, let's look at what is coming in the near future. Um, we have elections coming up in Ecuador. And the interesting thing is that an indigenous leader who present himself as an ecologist and uh, with progressive leaning mobilizes against uh, the anti-imperialist forces, which is uh, headed by uh, followers of Korea. Korea, and then uh, the left in the West gets confused. Because at the same time, he's attacking Venezuela. He's supporting the coup in, 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 in Bolivia. What's your take on it? Uh, OK. Uh, before we go into this topic, let me just finish the other line of thought, which is that there were then sub coup d'etat going on against uh, also Lula, against Nilma in Brazil, then Lula in Brazil, then uh, um, then in, in Argentina, Macri, the right winger, won the next elections, was four years there, destroyed a lot of stuff. And now, the, again, there is a return of the Kirchner uh, movement or party, but not in the same, not even as close in its radicalness to what Kirchner was before the, 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 the Macri government. And then, uh, so you have in Honduras, in Paraguay, attempts in Venezuela, unsuccessful, a coup in Bolivia, in, uh, in Brazil, uh, the defeat of the left for four years in Argentina, but now they're back. Uh, and the treason of Lenin Moreno in Ecuador. Lenin Moreno was the candidate that was part of the movement of Correa, Okay, who came to power with the program of Korea, you know, against neoliberalism and all of that. And then when he came to power, he betrayed everything he promised and the movement. He became a tool of US imperialism. Okay, he became neoliberal. neoliberal. He opened Ecuador to US military bases. He opened, uh, he, he deregulated the economy and the, um, the resources of the currency flows and allow the rich people to take their dollars away from Ecuador to bank accounts elsewhere and so on. I mean, so he, be, he betrayed everything and set back everything Korea have achieved and then start privatizing natural resources, start uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff and 
gave back the country to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, with a very draconian neoliberal austerity program in exchange for, for um, loans from IMF, okay? And so as part of the loans, it was required to cut off a lot of money from public health that Correa has uh, put a lot of money there and improved the public health system. All of that was cut. A lot of uh, nurses, a lot of doctors were you know, sent to unemployment. A lot of hospitals were closed. And then suddenly you had the pandemic and they, were, they couldn't face the crisis because they have cut off the resources because IMF deal implied to cut off all the money for public health. And then they were probably the worst country in Latin America in terms of the pandemic in the sense that you have a lot of people dying and they couldn't, they were dying in their houses and they couldn't even take them to, to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So the bodies were inside the houses. And then when they were getting rotten, they would put it in front of their houses in the streets. It was like, how can I say? It was super, super, uh, how can I say? Like a, like a hell mm -hmm. situation there, uh, like hell, you know, it was very bad. And all because IMF has forced Ecuador because of the betrayal of Lady Moreno to cut off all the money and resources in public health. Mm -hmm. And they were not prepared to, to confront what, what, was, what came mm -hmm. with the COVID-19. So, um, so now in Ecuador, there, this guy, Lenny Moreno, he lost all credibility among people, okay? He lost all the credibility because that's, I mean, he has like four, in the surveys, he has 4% of, popular support, 4% is the lowest of the lowest. So he was not the candidate the empire put forward because the guy was burned out, you know, because of all the trail he did, the empire was happy with him. And so, uh, but they put then alternative candidates to him. Uh, so that the Correa candidate, the Proco, because the other thing they do all these soft coup de task including the betrayal of Lenin Moreno, is what is called lawfare, lawfare. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, uh, what is called lawfare. Lawfare is a mechanism used to criminalize the movements, the progressive leaders, the left, et cetera, so that they cannot become candidates in the next election. That's what they did with Lula, and that's what they did with Correa. So Correa couldn't, Correa cannot even enter the country. So they, they fabricate false accusations in the courts to criminalize them. And so they're not able to run as candidates again in the next elections, okay? So now the Correa movement uh, that became independent from Lenin Moreno, I mean, basically expelled Moreno from, from, the, from the movement, uh, they present a, diff a new candidate in this election. And then, uh, what is happening is that he won the first round of the election with like 38% of the votes. They need to go to a second round between the one who came second and the one who come first, they do a second round. Now, what the empire did, which is very interesting, we have talked here about liberal multiculturalism as a strategy of white supremacy inside the USA. But we haven't talked about how this liberal multiculturalism as a form of white supremacy, USA uses abroad in its imperial uh, strategies today. So Ecuador is a good example of this. They put forward a candidate which is financed by US empire with an NGO called Pachacuti, who, who was back in the 90s, was a very, very radical indigenous movement, and then turned into becoming, became an, an, a kind of NGO with funds from Europe and USA, pushing the agendas that they're pushing forward 
they are against the Bolivarian Revolution. They were against Evo Morales. They supported the coup d'etat against Evo Morales. They supported the coup d'etat Guaido against the Bolivarian government. They, I mean, they are on record in the worst, uh, with the worst statements you can imagine. And, and this candidate called Jaco is an indigenous guy with, that with, a, with an indigenous face is promoting a so-called a leftist and even they use the term decolonial agenda, which is totally perverse. A, a calling for a, you know as candidate for president, and then you have the intellectuals that I call the pseudo leftists. Some of them calling themselves decolonial a, were the same ones who supported the coup d'etat that wrote documents against the Venez Bolivarian revolution in the middle of the coup d'etat, okay? The same ones who were against Evo Morales in the middle of the coup d'etat, okay? Against Evo Morales. These people who suddenly show up in the middle of a, of a serious conflict on the side of empire against the progressive governments. These people are the same ones now supporting Jack and recycling the image of Jaku as a leftist and even decolonial candidate, and saying this is the first decolonial left in Latin America, la, 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 and so on. When in fact, this guy is really funded, financed, and ideologically lined up with US empire, okay? And he has even said already that he will never make any treaty with China. He will always do negotiation with the US, and so on. I mean, all this stuff, is on record supporting coup d'etat, supporting, I mean, he's on record on all this stuff. And this is the candidate that is put forward uh, by the empire as a kind of multicultural liberalism. Because this guy gives a multicultural face, you see, to, in a sense, uh, imperialist white supremacist domination of Ecuador. But there is another candidate, which is a a white Creole elite from Ecuador who is neo openly neoliberal, who by the way, this Jack who supported this guy, this entrepreneur in the last elections, you know? And now they are kind of together against the candidacy of the Pro Correa president that is running now uh, for president, won the first round and has the possibility of winning the second round. But now they are putting together their forces, the white Creole oligarchy entrepreneur, this guy whose last name is Lasso, uh, who is a neoliberal, with Jaku, with this indigenous guy, uh, to fight back this, the, the, in the second round, the, uh, the candidacy, the Pro Correa progressive candidacy, candidates, you know, candidate. And then, uh, this, uh, the, the thing, the, the, the difficulty between these two is that they were fighting in terms of who was going to be the second candidate. You see, who, who came second in the elections will be the runner against the one who came first in the second round, you see. And the problem was that they were all Jasso and Jaku, both of them have like 19% of the vote, 19% mm -hmm. Jaku. 19% Yasu. They were the, the differences were just a few thousand votes. And so Jaku was claiming there was a electoral fraud to destroy his candidates. Okay. And he was accusing the Korea forces of doing that, which is crazy because the Korea forces are out of power. They don't have the power uh, to control that because the Korea forces are the ones trying to recover uh, the, the, the government lost by the betrayal of Lenin Moreno. And also, uh, and so he's trying to fight now Lasso to become himself the second candidate. But in the, in the electoral counting or recounting of the votes, Lasso apparently won the, the second, he became second and now the second round will be Lasso, this white oligarchy 
uh, of Ecuador neoliberal against the Correa candidate, you see? And, um, and then Jaku now is trying to fight back uh, accusing uh, the electoral uh, office there of fraud and things like this. But in the end, they understand each other, both just Lasso and Jaku, and they're going together. In, in a sense, they're going to make a block so that the pro Korea forces won't come back. And these are the forces of empire. And, and what is confusing is to see a candidate who call himself left, who call himself even the colonial, you know, uh, recycling imperialist, uh, you know, pro imperialist rhetoric, you know, pro imperialist uh, uh, concepts and ideas, you know, and this is how perverse uh, U.S. you know U.S. imperialist politics have developed in a moment of decadence, where they now uh, liberal multiculturalism become for them in a way an alternative to fight back the progressive or anti-imperialist left in Latin America. And, and this creates a lot of confusion because you have a lot of people of the left in the, in the rest of the world buying into this rhetoric. And you have foundations uh, putting money behind this candidacy, foundations from the global north putting money to Yaku and Pachacuti movement, all this stuff, okay, which are imperialist foundations. And, and also you have a, um, you know, a lot of these networks of this, what I call these pseudo lefties or what I call colonial decolonials, okay? Uh, to, to use a term to, to call attention to how this intel group of network of intellectuals and all these groups calling themselves decolonial and leftists are really colonial and imperialist, you know, in, in the way they, they, they are developing their policies in the region. So they're even appropriating terms like left and left and appropriating terms like decolonial, okay, to promote colonial policies, okay, imperialist policies. So this is perverse, this is very perverse. This is happening as we talk. And some of the figures known in around the world as, you know, decolonial intellects and so on are supporting some of these networks, you know, and some of these policies against the Bolivarian revolution, against the, you know, uh, the, the progressive government in Bolivia and against the Correa progressive government and progressive forces and so on, okay? And so you hear, and I, you know, I have to mention them by name. I'm sorry, I cannot hold on this because in a sense they're doing a propaganda around the world, you know, that are really bad. So you have people like Gardo Lander, you have people like uh, Maristela Svampa, uh, you have people like um, Walter Minolo, okay? Who is signing some of the documents against the Bolivarian government and revolution. You have, I mean, you have, People like that that have a, you know, are well known among the colonial networks and so on, you know, signing documents like this and taking side with the wrong people. Even Catherine Welsh, to my surprise, you know, has been also backing up the Yaku forces and, you know, signing documents against the Bolivarian Revolution and, and so on, you know. So, anyway, uh, so I, I am really, really, uh, uh, I, I have taken for people who, who do, do not read Spanish or do not know, you know, uh, the language. I've been very involved in these debates for the past, I don't know, four or five years. Okay, calling attention to how a lot of the so-called decolonials uh, are taking side with imperial, posi pro-imperial position in moments of conflicts that we need to know who is the enemy and what is behind the whole thing. You know, even someone like Aníbal Quijano, at the end of his life, he signed one of these documents of these decolonial colonials, you know, that are repeating the same narratives of the empire about the Bolivarian revolution, about the Bolivarian government, about Maduro as leader of, as a democratic elected leader, 
calling them authoritarian, dictator, and so on. You know, everything that the empire says, repeated by these people, okay? But more perverse, because they say, they, they talk in the name of the colonial, left and decoloniality, you know? So, my God, where are we going with this, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and the elections in Venezuela is, are very clearly transparent elections, internal democratic process. It's one of the most transparent systems an uncorrupt system in the world, in planet Earth, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the electoral uh, uh, system in Venezuela, to the point that the Jimmy Carter Foundation goes there every year, to, every time there are elections, I say every year because the Bolivarian Revolution have had 26 elections in 20 years. Mm -hmm. You cannot get a government with more democratic elections than Venezuela, but they still call it a dictatorship, you know? And they lost two elections, the, the Chavista forces of the 26, and they recognized the loss when they lost. They did not do a coup, they did not, they recognized the loss. They, they did not uh, uh, did electoral fraud or anything like that. And the Jimmy Carter Foundation, Jimmy Carter, you cannot call Jimmy Carter or, or the foundation of Jimmy Carter some leftist thing, you know? They go every year there, every year that with elections in Venezuela and they always come out and say, this is clean, everything is clean here. There's nothing, even the ex-president of Spain, a social democrat that you cannot say Chavista or anything like that. He's been there he always come out and say, these are elections are clean. There's nothing, no, they, nobody has stole election, but US empire keep repeating this slide, the European Union go along with that in order, and then they expropriate all the resources of Venezuela in the world, bank accounts, enterprises, you name it, more than 50,000 million dollars have been expropriated, 50 billion dollars, okay, from Venezuela in the name of Guaido being the president of Venezuela. Guaido, a guy who had never uh, been elected president, he, he called himself president and, and, and in, in, a, in, a, in a square in Venezuela. And then immediately Trump recognizing, immediately European Union recognizing and use that recognition to expropriate all the resources of Venezuela. This is why Venezuela is in a very tough economic situation today because they did sanctions and expropriate the resources of the country, bank accounts, gold, gold for example. They have reserve of gold in banks in London that have been taken by the banks. Uh, billions of dollars in bank accounts around the world, all taken. You know, the enterprise CITGO in the US, a very profitable enterprise that belonged to the Venezuelan government. It's a refinery, a oil refinery and a gas stations all over the US, it was taken over to. I mean, and, and then you have people like this signing documents saying all this garbage and even meeting with Guaido. I, there are photos of the Gardo Lander and the group who create all these documents meeting with Guaido. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you just, you begin to ask yourself for whom these people work, okay? Or, or who is paying them? And then when you start looking who is paying them, you see the same pattern, which is what? German so-called leftist foundation channeling funds to the pseudo left that the empire wants to support. And there is a long tradition of US empire channeling CIA funds through pseudo left founda German foundations. You could go back to the 50s and 60s with the Willy Brandt Foundation. You remember Willy Brandt was the leader of the social democrat German left, pseudo left. And they were channeling funds to, uh, for example, um, Felipe Gonzalez in Spain, so that the left won't win election, then they would put money in the social Democrats, such as Felipe Gonzalez, millions of dollars so that they win the election and they keep in power and they put obstacle to a really progressive left government in Spain. They did the same in Portugal with the transition to democracy with this, uh, to, with Mario Suarez, they channel a lot of funds with the social democrat leader there, like Felipe Gonzalez in Spain, you know, and, and they did this all over the world. And now there are other new uh, foundations, they have a, a leftist image, you see, 
This is how, because the CIA, if they want to keep their pseudo left alive, they cannot send money directly to them because it will look bad to this movement. You see, immediately everybody will see all oh, these people are CIA infiltrated forces, right? But the way they do it then is indirectly. They will channel the funds through German foundation to have this, you know, uh, leftist image, quote unquote. I call them pseudo left from Germany. And now they are challenging funds. And there are several, it's not just the Willy Brandt, there's several of them. And today the Willy Brandt has a secondary role, like, you know, it's not anymore as important as it was. Today there are other foundations, German foundation in Latin America, channeling funds. And did you look at the pattern? They're all, when they're criticizing extractivist industry, they're not criticizing the, trans, the, the transnational, multinational companies doing extractivism in Chile, doing extractivism in, 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 in Brazil or in, no, they're, they're attacking the progressive governments in Latin America that nationalize from transnational corporations, some of these industries and are, are using the profits to improve uh, education, health care, and other things of the people. You see, so, so suddenly you start saying, oh my God, you know, what's going on here? So in the name of, I am in the long run and destructivist. I think we should come to a world where we can have uh, uh, economies that are not destructive of the ecology of the planet. I am the first one to defend that, but, but wait a minute, all these countries like Venezuela or like Bolivia, they inherit an, in, a, in an imperialist system, they inherit in the international division of labor, okay, a role of exporting a raw material to, to, you know, for the capitalist imperialist interest. So in the case of Venezuela, it was exporting of oil, okay? And that's what they do in many countries around the world. You know what I mean, it's, it's, it's a classic of the imperialist capitalist international division of labor. Now, the progressive governments come, they inherit, they inherit, this structure of, of imperialism that have been there for hundreds of years. And now they, they try to transform the economy, to diversify economy. That's something you cannot do overnight. It takes a long period of time to diversify an economy that have been for hundreds of years under imperialist control, exporting only one item, okay? And now you pretend that by a parliamentary decree, they should eliminate extractivist in, in industry tonight which will mean the collapse of the economy in these places because it takes a while to, to recover or diversify the economy away from what you have inherited. Mm -hmm. So it's not the fault of the progressive governments that they have extractivist industries. You know, what they did in the moment momentarily is to take over this, nationalize the profits, nationalize the royalties or nationalize the, the resources themselves and that's why they, the U.S. is mad at them, because the U.S. empire and and the multinational company wants to control that. They don't want that in the hands of governments to distribute the profits as resources to benefit the people there in healthcare, education, poverty programs, and you name it. You know that's why they're pissed off. So suddenly you have this German foundation now doing studies even publishing books against the progressive governments in Latin America for being extractivists. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, if you look at Venezuela, they're looking in the long run to overcome this dependency on the oil extractivist industry. They, are, they have even a ministry called Eco-Socialist Minister, an ecological ministry trying to deal with the problem of the ecology, trying to deal, they have communal forms of a, a, you know, a development of economy and so on, trying to diversify the economy, doing all this effort. But that's not something you can do overnight after so many centuries of domination of, of, of imperialist system in these countries. And these people come with an ultra radical leftist argument mm -hmm. saying they are, they are uh, right wingers because they don't eliminate extractivism overnight. You see, mm -hmm. uh, or they don't, they should pass a decree and close down all the structure. I mean, to do that, you, what, is, what is going to happen? The economy collapses. Next thing is going to happen is that you're going to have back US imperialism in the place. 
exploiting or super exploiting in a hyper extractivist way all these resources. That's what is going to happen. And that's what you could see that happen when the Evo Morales government was destroying it in this coup d'etat in November 2019, the year that you have those dictators there, the first thing they did was what? Turn in the country to the IMF, like Lenin Moreno did in, in Ecuador. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Bolivia, they also uh, tried to uh, privatize the, the resources, the natural resources again in the, for the hands of multinational corporations like Lenin Moreno is doing in Ecuador. I mean, so the whole thing, and I remember the month before the coup against Evo Morales during the, the in the month of October, okay? Before the elections, I remember seeing a world campaign at an international level where they were saying that Evo Morales has burned the Amazon. You remember those burning of the Amazon mm -hmm. due to the Bolsonaro policies, okay? This fascist guy in power after the sub coup d'etat against Lula, okay? And against Nilma, this guy come to power, okay? While they have Lula in a prison so he cannot run for candidate and they bring this guy to, to, to power and this guy with his policies basically burned the Amazons. Mm -hmm. And now in the international press, suddenly you start seeing a propaganda the month before the elections of late October, 2019 in Bolivia, that Evo Morales was, uh, has burned the Amazon, accusing him of burning the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So with all the critiques we can have to Evo Morales or to the Bolivarian government, I'm sorry, these are progressive governments and they're, I mean, you cannot accuse Evo Morales of burning the Amazon. This is ridiculous. And they were, <laughs> and so they were, when I saw that, do you, I said to myself, oh my God, these people are going to, is already organizing a coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened a month later. They, they did a coup d'etat. I knew it just because I saw in the propaganda internationally, not just in Bolivia, in the world at large, they were doing, saying this. And then you see again, the German foundations funding the campaign leftist German foundation in the name of ecological arguments and stuff like that. You say, what the hell is going on here? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I'm sorry, you have uh, people who people read in other parts of the world as if they were like, the colonial progressive, uh, you know, like the names I already mentioned, uh, Arturo Escobar, another one, you know, that I, I have to mention here. Uh, translated to English, published in English, uh, you know, Aníbal Quijano himself, uh, you know, at the end of his life, uh, Walter Mignolo, uh, you know, Catherine Welsh, uh, Edgardo Lander, uh, all these people that people read as some kind of decolonial progressive people, but in practice, in the politics of Latin America, they are on the other side of the trenches, shooting, at us, okay? Mm -hmm. They're not with us shooting at them. They are in the other side of the trenches shooting at us, okay? I have, before my break with this network, I was calling attention. Unfortunately, most of this is in Spanish language to the epistemological failures at the level of epistemology. I could see a lot of epistemic extractivism you know, a lot of colonial epistemology being reproduced among these authors and stuff. But now it's not just epistemological, it's political. It's a political move that I find it very problematic. And I call it perverse because if you call these people, if you do all these things in the name of the coloniality, this is perverse. You see, it's completely perverse. And so uh, I call attention to this. Uh, and I've been calling in Latin America, these debates are already way, in a sense, in the past. Everybody knows where these people are standing now. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in other parts of the world, people don't know these debates and don't mm -hmm. know about all these details, you know? Yeah. And, okay. and part of the confusion 
do have to do with this liberal multiculturalism it deep down all these networks are very liberal very liberal multicultural in the way they handle their politics and their theories okay mm -hmm. and 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 that's what u.s imperialism is promoting these days and that's why you have them many times on the side of imperialism mm -hmm. against the people okay and the struggles of the people and the imperial struggle of the people in the region okay because of the ideology of liberalism multicultural liberalism also there is an ideology very strong ingrained because you don't I know you know this book of negri tony negri this italian marxist super eurocentric book uh it's called empire where he said that imperialism is over there's no more core periphery in the international in the international division of labor uh, now we are at a different stage uh, that is beyond imperialism and all this stuff, you know, and a lot of these people bought into that. They think they, they think the region without the concept of imperialism present, you see? And if you do that in, in any place in the global South today, you're going to commit a lot of political errors. And not only that, you're going to be on the side of the empire in many of the countries because you, are, you don't have a clear cartography of power. You are, you are attacking Venezuela, you know, and the government of Maduro, oh, because look at the economic situation. This is the fall of the government of Maduro. I'm sorry, you don't understand imperialism. If you don't understand that the problems, economic problems of Venezuela is part of a US empire a war against the Venezuelan government. To begin with this hyperinflation mechanism that the CIA have done, have used for I don't know how many years now, you know, decades to destroy governments. And they've been doing that in Venezuela. I mean, you don't know this, this is ABC. So what happened inside, inside Venezuela? I mean, empire is not out there, outside. They are inside the structures of these countries and yeah, it's affecting the economy. Country. Look at Iran today. Iran is all going also through economic difficulty. The, all the sanctions, all the boycott put forward by US empire is affecting the economy. I mean, there's no way you can say, oh, this is the fall, all the fall of the government and, la, 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 and, and blame the, the government as if it had nothing to do with, with US empire. I'm sorry, I don't buy this, okay? okay? Yes, the government might have problems, might have mistakes. You can go over that, evaluate, but the main problem of this country is not the mistake of this policy or that policy. The main problem is US imperialist warfare and economic warfare, military warfare and economic warfare against these governments, you know? And so if you don't understand that, I always say all, uh, all anti, not all anti-imperialists are decolonial, but all decolonial have to be first and before anything else anti-imperialists. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what, what decoloniality are we talking about? You know, we cannot leave behind anti-imperialism. You know, I call for a struggle against the multiplicity of power relations of, uh, mo you know, modernity and capitalist patriarchal modernity. I, 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 I am for all these struggles, you know, uh, but we cannot lose sight uh, imperialism as one of the central axes of power of this modern civilization and how they are is play out to destroy countries and people around the world. If you don't understand this, what kind of decoloniality is this? This is just a, a, an academic fact, you know, an academic fashion or some kind of, uh, you know, of, of tool used by, by imperialism against the people, you see? Now confusing people with these terms, you see? And now you have a candidate like that supported by these people that is half an indigenous face repeating imperialist, neoliberal, all kind of rhetoric there, you know, in the name of the coloniality and left. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I am, I'm sorry about my passion talking about this, but it's something that is the first time I think I talk about this in English language. I have many videos, I have many writings, interventions in the past five years on these debates mm -hmm. in Spanish yes, language, because these debates happen in Latin America. And I've been very involved in this, uh, criticizing these tendencies. I have to say that it's not only me, it's also Enrique Dussel, 
who has called attention to these problems and this decolonial colonial, by the way, he always correct me because I use this in euphemistic way. I say that the so-called de the colonial decolonials, no? The people who call themselves decolonial, but really are colonials. You always correct me and say, Ramon, stop using that because these people are not, the word decolonial, you shouldn't even use it in euphemistic ways like this colonial decolonial. You should, we should call them what they are. These are people who were in the decolonial bus. They step out of the bus, they got out of the bus, the decolonial bus continue. And now these people are colonial pro-imperialist people. And we should stop using even euphemistically these terms. We should call them what they are. They're took side with empire, they're colonial and stop using the term decolonial to characterize or call them. You know, he, he, he corrected me saying this, you know? And, and, Let's go and to I'm saying conclusion, this, not right? only me, no, there's no. other people. No. I have to say, for example, just, just a second, I have to say just, for example, that uh, there are other people in the network of decolonial that haven't signed the documents of them. I have to clarify this. You know, not everybody who called themselves decolonial took that route, okay? Uh, but there are some people that, that I mentioned their names here have taken this route and we need to call them by their names. There's no other, no other way. Okay, so we'll conclude this uh, session here, uh, you know, with um, uh, the remark that um, the age old struggle in the activist movement of who is the main enemy, where to focus on, and how does it relate with what Lenin called uh, ultra leftism, uh, where basically you use leftist argument to support pro-imperialist forces, uh, which is uh, basically a very old uh, struggle, which is here. Exactly. Let's see what uh, Ecuador will bring in April when they have the second round. And then we'll see what uh, the relationship of forces in Latin America will be. And we'll evaluate that the next time. Thank you very much. You know much. what they're doing now, uh, mm -hmm. uh, do before we finish? They're accusing this guy who won the, the first round who is pro Correa, pro, you know, anti neoliberal, they're accusing him of being funded by the Colombian guerrilla and drug cartels. Mm. Okay? So they're already throwing that there, yeah. okay? To discredit him. So, and, and guess what? You have Jaku repeating this. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm sorry, this is like, I'm, I mean, <clears throat> who, who is, I mean, who is orchestrating these lies? Okay, uh, it's it's obvious who they who is behind the whole thing, you know. Okay. And it's U.S. empire and its allies, you know, uh, uh, neo-colonial elites in the region, you know. So we'll see, we'll uh, this see is what, what is behind you. the whole thing. Yeah, you don't understand this. I'm sorry, you are in outer space, mm -hmm. and that's what I think of some of these people that they are in outer space and they're on the side of empire. This is what they are, right? Now. You know, okay. unfortunately. Ramon. Okay, okay. okay. You right. take care. Right.